Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on how to write a research paper, which is a very important topic, especially for early career scientists. So I'm sure we have a very interesting session today. Uh, my name is Eduardo Queiroz Alves. I'm EGU's editorial manager, and our speaker today is Ken Carslaw, who is a professor in the Institute for Climate and Atmospheric Science at the University of Leeds in the UK. Ken is also chief executive editor of Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, which is one of the EGU journals. So before I hand over to Ken, I just want to remind you that this session is being recorded and will soon be made available on EGU's YouTube channel. Uh, please send your questions using the Q&A box and we will make sure to answer at least some of them after the presentation. So welcome, Ken, um, and I would like to invite you to give your presentation now. Okay, thank you, Eduardo. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, so uh, welcome, everyone. So um, this is a um, short uh, webinar on how to write a research paper. Um, this is based on a course I teach at, at Leeds. I'll say a little bit about that in, in, in a moment. Um, I'm going to talk, aim to talk for about half an hour, and then hopefully we'll have some, plenty of time for, for questions. So this is quite a condensed um, summary of how to write a research paper. We can't certainly can't cover absolutely everything, but Hopefully I can leave you with some hints and tips that will be useful um, as you set out on writing your first articles. Okay, so I think it's, um, it's, it's not sufficient, it seems, to look at lots of examples of articles and suddenly you're able to do it. Um, because I, I've witnessed that very often, that obviously scientists who are starting their PhD, doing their PhD, read a lot of articles and yet when they set about writing one suddenly they're writing one that doesn't really look very much like the ones they've read it's not structured correctly it's not um, it doesn't have the correct um, scientific flow and logic etc um, so it's clearly difficult to just look at examples and then translate that into um, a good article yourself so that step's very substantial so i think you need some tuition um, but you need lots of practice but finding, having some hints and tips right at the beginning can shorten the time, I think, to writing good articles. And I have good evidence of that in Leeds when we teach this to our master's students. We really do shorten the time from students who really have no idea how to write a scientific article to writing pretty good ones all within their first year. So that, bear in mind when we say writing an article, there are several aspects of that. Um, which we're not going to cover all of them today, so that if you submit your article to a journal, then it will be assessed for scientific significance, scientific quality, and presentation, or things similar to that. Um, so significance and quality, those are the aspects of your own research, um, which then have to be reflected in your article. So it's not entirely just what goes on before you start writing your article, but we're not going to cover the as those aspects here. I'm going to focus mo mostly on the presentation. How do you actually uh, do, do the writing. And that's all about the structure, the flow, the logic, clarity, etc. of your of your writing. There are also technical aspects, how you set your equations, how you deal with your symbols and units, etc., which are all very important for presentation and would be assessed by reviewers. Uh, and also appearance, how, how engaging are your figures, how clearly are you getting your message across. But I'm mostly going to focus on just the writing part, so the bit in, in orange there. So as, as I say, this is, a, this is based on master's module we teach at Leeds, where we take the students through how to write an article right from the beginning to the end. And we use that as a way of getting them to read lots of research articles. And then we get them to do things like rewrite the abstract or uh, shorten the abstract, expand the abstract, improve it, etc. Um, and they get a lot out of that while also learning lots of science. So it's really a hands-on workshop-led course. So what I'm going to give you here is really just a very condensed um, summary of, of the sorts of things we teach there. There is an article associated with this, um, and I'll make that available um, once I've converted it from being available at Leeds to being more publicly um, aimed. So uh, we can perhaps send that out. All right, so the art of scientific writing. So scientific writing needs to be clear, accurate, unambiguous, logical, concise. It needs to be many, many things. So there, when you're start, starting to write your articles, you may have some of these things in your head and thinking, how do I achieve all of these things? 
So I'm going to break it down in a moment and um, try and simplify how you can think about uh, structuring your articles. So the main purpose of scientific writing is to convey information. So it's mostly functional, but functional can also be very boring. So it clearly isn't just functional. You know, you could write an article that said, we measured the rate, we plotted the data, we analyzed the results. It's very boring. And you wouldn't really write like that. So I think what I see, um, having been involved with something like 250 papers, is people struggling with how to not be completely functional, but not also not to write a piece of um, you know, English prose. They, they, they really struggle. Where's the middle ground where my article is going to be functional, but also readable and interesting, enjoyable and engaging? So I think that's where people really start to struggle. Um, and I, I get that that is, you know, a large part of that is related to your skill also in English. Um, but it's all about maximizing the transfer of information. And if something is easy to read and very enjoyable to read and looks nice, then in psychology, this is understand, understood as something called cognitive ease. You're, you're more receptive to new information if you're enjoying doing something. If an article is hard work and there are lots of obstacles in the way, it's not an enjoyable experience, then you won't receive that information as readily as if the article is beautifully written and looks nice. Okay, so bear in mind um, the psychology of, uh, of writing articles. You're writing for people's enjoyment as well as um, information flow. So I'm, this is the thing I'm going to emphasize, structure, structure, structure. Okay, it, if you think of your article at all levels as being as having structure and focusing on what that structure is, then I think you will immediately start writing better articles. So in a, the difference between a scientific piece of writing and a story, of course, is um, we have a structure already for us. We have the title, abstract, introduction, methods and results, or something similar to that, um, unlike a piece of uh, a story where we may just have an entire chapter. So we already have structure and, and then you create your own structure on top of that with sections and subsections. And you have to choose those that allow people to navigate very well your article. But I think people forget that the structure goes deeper as well. The paragraphs have structure, the sentences within paragraphs have structure and the text within sentences are also structured. And if you think about the structure going all the way through your article, as I'm going to explain here a bit, then I think you'll start writing better articles. And I think what most people do is they sit down and say, right, title, abstract, introduction. I need to write an introduction. And they just go at it without thinking anymore about what's the structure of the introduction. What does it need to do? What am I trying to achieve? Um, and if you start thinking much more about the structure at multiple levels, then I think writing an article becomes less of this major thing that you have to do at the end of your, of your research. So I'm going to break this rest of this presentation down into these two aspects, the, the major structural element of the uh, of the article, title, abstract, introduction, etc, and just give you some pointers about the structural elements in those that will make your writing better. And then how to think about the, the deeper structure. And uh, what do I mean by structure going all the way down through uh, the article? So first of all, the, the components of the article. First of all, you have to bear in mind that journal and article types vary quite a lot, but they all have a pretty recognizable structure. Um, you might submit to a letter style journal like Geophysical Research Letters or Nature, where the structure is a little bit turned on its head. Um, I'm mostly gonna be talking about long format articles where we have a what's known as the IMRAD structure. So we have a classical introduction method results and discussion, and that's called IMRAD. Um, sometimes the methods are removed from you know, nature articles and put at the end, and you just have a brief summary at the beginning. That is very hard to write, I find. Okay, so a classic IMRAD structure is, I think most of the articles that most people spend their time writing. Let's start with the title. We, not surely nothing could be easier than coming up with the title of your article. Um, you just have to write um, um, what it's about. That's not my approach. Um, it's very easy to write very boring, non-engaging titles. So we call those in our journal, Yasso papers, yet another study of um, a study of cloud acidity in the UK climate model. 
It tells me what it's about, but it doesn't tell me what you did, what you found, or anything at all. It's just a very boring uh, title that you might use as a dissertation where you didn't discover anything, but you just need to say what your dissertation is about, okay? That is not really ideal for articles. Who's going to dip into that article and find out more? It doesn't tell you very much at all. So you can start to embellish that title a little bit by adding the development or the method. What, what did you develop? What was the method you used? A new treatment of cloud acidity, a machine learning approach to cloud acidity, et cetera. It already adds um, context and might, may make someone go in and, and, and read it. You can go a little bit further. You can talk about the field relevance, a stu study of cloud acidity and aerosol forcing. Okay, and that's the relevance. That's why you studied um, cloud acidity. We can focus a little bit more on the outcomes of the findings. So large effect of cloud acidity on aerosol forcing. Historical increases in cloud acidity reduce aerosol forcing. So we're drawing out the result a little bit. Um, so this is when I'm, my students, postdocs write articles and they come up with a title. We then look at the title and say, can we push it a little bit more towards what we found? And not everybody agrees with this approach. They say you should just have a neutral title. Don't push what you've discovered. I, I disagree. I think the title should be engaging. It should make you want to go in and, and read it. And if you're lucky, you may have the option to push that even further uh, and discuss the wider relevance or what we often call the impact. Increasing cloud acidity over the last 20 years, reduced aerosol forcing and accelerated global warming. Really strong statement. And that's going to make you want to go in and read that article. Okay, so when you're writing the title, just think how far um, along that path you can go without pushing it too far. You don't want to oversell your results in the title, um, but you should certainly think whether you can draw out some of the findings. So this is something people do, I think, very badly. And this is something we've recently changed in our journal to ask authors to consider a little bit the structure of their title. All right, the abstract. So if the title is the name of the shop, then I think of the abstract as the shop window. Is it worth going in? Are you interested, having read the title and abstract? Quite often you read the title and the abstract and you think, nothing in there for me. Okay, so you need to write abstracts that have all the key information that people are expecting to read at that point. They typically vary between 120 words in science, I think that's still the case, up to 300 words, some people are writing abstracts of 500 words, which are almost an essay in their own right. I think that's, that's way too long. They have to cover about seven points. These ones are written here, and I'm going to show you now an abstract that has these seven points uh, in them. And this is what we now ask authors in abstract chemistry and physics to consider. Please write your abstract as much as possible covering these seven points. And our abstracts have improved considerably since we asked. And people have said, this is good advice because I never really thought about it. <laughs> so nobody ever, nobody ever tells them how to write an abstract. But here's an abstract of 135 words with one sentence for each of those. We won't spend too long reading it, but you can come back to it and, and look at it later. Topic, status, the gap, the objective, the approach, the results, the implications, all there, one sentence for each. Okay, so the introductory sentence, um, what's the topic? Aerosol radiative thwarting of climate is one of the largest uncertainties in climate change. The status, what do we know? Previous modeling studies have shown, dot, dot, dot. What's the gap? However, these results fail to explain why similar emissions, dot, dot, dot. And then the objective, what are you going to do? And then the approach, we use the global aerosol model. So if you structure it like that, then that's a good start. So our journal allows 250 words in the abstract, so you can almost um, almost double what's here. Most people would then expand on the results and number six and possibly the implications. Some articles need the method expanding because that's, you know, you develop some cool machine learning approach or whatever, and that's what you're trying to sell. Um, so use this as a basis and then expand out the various bits that need it. And it's very easy then to keep within 250 words. Okay. Jumping into the introduction, so what the introduction is not, is is not a literature review. Many early career scientists come to 
writing papers, perhaps from having done a master's degree where they maybe write a dissertation. And in the beginning of every dissertation in a university is often a literature review. This is not what the introduction of, an, of, of a research article is. Okay, and I think you've learned the wrong thing if you've written a literature review uh, at university and then have to unlearn that and write an introduction. Okay, so an introduction is different in that it takes the reader from what is known about the topic to why you're exploring it and what you aim to achieve. Okay, so it's weaving in what you are doing. It's not just a, a bland, disconnected literature review of the status of knowledge. That's not what it is. So here's an example. Um, I'm going to show some screenshots from this paper from one of my students um, a few years ago, which I think nicely illustrates what I mean by weaving in what you're doing. Here's the first paragraph. So that was the, we had the title of the abstract, and this is the first paragraph of the introduction. So it, it talks about volcanic eruptions and what they do to the climate. But already at the first, at the last sentence of the first paragraph, it's saying why this is important. It's important to understand the potential climatic impact of an eruption, dot, dot, dot. So it's already setting the scene about what this article is going to be about. In second paragraph, several modeling studies have investigated influence of important eruption source parameters, but only for a limited number of eruptions. OK, so you're already indicating to the readers that, aha, uh -huh, you're going to be working. This paper is going to be about more eruptions than most papers. And then a couple of sentences later, these studies also focus on the effects of variations and parameter values, which leaves open all, almost all of the multidimensional parameter space unexplored. So that's clear your article is going to explore more of the parameter space. OK, so you're reviewing the literature while connecting it continuously to the purpose of your work. So it's really not just a disconnected uh, literature review. This is the end of the third paragraph. I think this introduction only had three paragraphs. Um, is at the end of that, it says, and a comprehensive and systematic investigation of such joint effects while accounting for changes in, to the aerosol particle size distribution has not been conducted. So we're going to do that. Okay, so it's continuously connecting to what you're doing. So when you get to the end of the introduction, it, you could write a paragraph that introduces the article and it, would, it could read like this. So in this study, we aim to do some research that ought to be well motivated by the time you get here. Okay, if you've reached the end of the introduction and it's not quite clear what this article is going to be about and what questions it's addressing, then that introduction has not worked. Okay, it needs to already, you ought to be able to, as a reader, write that final paragraph this research article is going to be about because it ought to be so clear to you by the time you get there. Okay, so that's the key thing that I think people get wrong in the introduction. Methods, I only have one slide on this, it's really just to address the main question that most people have about it. So the methods these days, most journals are quite happy to have sections in there rather than just the methods. They may have a section called field campaign, model description, data sets. You can wrap that all into a section called methods, but you definitely need to break it down. Atmospheric science or geoscience in general is usually quite complex combining multiple aspects of the methods. Um, so you need subsections. And the big question I always get asked is voice and tense. Should it be in present tense and past tense, active voice, passive voice? Um, I would always recommend past tense because things you did were in the past. I think that makes most sense. Um, you can say we use a model, we introduce dot, 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 but I, I it was in the past, so it doesn't sound right to me to write in present tense. So I would use past, but I would use a mixture of active and passive. People get hung up on this. How should I use passive or should I use active? If you write for a journal and you've all read them, nature articles, science articles, etc., high impact articles, they very often use active voice. Here we show, and we did this, and we did that. And they're trying to engage with you more by writing like that. It's, it's a really obvious transition in writing style. Um, when people write for these more impactful journals, they tend to become more active. Um, I don't think you need to um, if you just write it well. So you could write passive all the time. Simulations were run, the data were analyzed, statistical tests were performed. It gets very boring. So 
what I tend to do is use passive voice for the bits that are fairly standard. Simulations were run. We used this standard model, but then, um, sorry, simulations were run, flow map was used, etc. cetera, for the name of the model. But then for the bits that are really unique to your work, the bits you really want to say, this is where we've pushed the field, we introduce several new parameters. So I switched to active voice. So I'm continuously switching from passive to active. And most people won't detect that, that, that you're doing that. Um, but it, it does make it easier to read and much less boring. Um, but it's not all active. It's not in your face. We did this, we did that. Um, so a mixture is perfectly fine. Um, so don't get hung up on whether it should be uh, active or passive. Just um, vary it a bit. All right, now the results. Um, this is the perennial question. Is it results, discussion, and conclusions? Or is it results and discussion with the conclusions? Or is it results with the discussion and conclusions? And uh, our journal is quite relaxed about that because we know different types of research need different structures. But I think it depends. If you have a lab study with one big result, like let's say you're measuring a rate coefficient, single rate coefficient, I, I think you would have a result section where you just present those results, very little discussion. Then you would have a discussion section. If you're having one of these big complex field modeling studies with lots of sub results along the way, I think it's really hard to avoid some discussion during the results. So you might want to have a results and discussion. But my advice would be to split it according to results, but include in there some discussion, not extensive discussion, but just very localized. You know, you want to compare your number to some other number where it was first introduced, but you don't want to discuss it at length. But it's still called the results section. And then you definitely need a discussion section because Complicated papers need a synthesis, and people look for that. Uh, they don't want it buried amongst the results. Uh, and then the conclusions, okay? that These have to be clear in an article. You want to be able to jump to the final section of an article and get the conclusions. Um, so these shouldn't really be buried amongst a lot of discussion, okay? So that's, that would be my standard way of, of doing it. Articles vary, and the extent of discussion varies as well. I'm going to skip over these, but I'm going to leave them on the screen just for a moment. So we provide some guidelines in our journal, Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, for what we typically expect to see in the discussion section. Okay, so you can come back and, and look at those. And it's just a, a reminder of what really ought to be there. And if it isn't, we ask our editors to, to ask for that information. And the same for the conclusions or the concluding section, as we call it. Um, the key point really is to be conclusive. You don't keep discussing. If you have a conclusion section, I want your conclusions, okay? It's like the final slide of your presentation. I don't want more discussion. I want your conclusions. So if you have a conclusion section, be conclusive. Right, so that was on the main structure. I'm gonna give some hints now on writing clearly. So this is the substructure that comes underneath all of this and it's the paragraphs and, and sentences and how we can think about structuring uh, for, for, for maximum transfer of information. So as I've said, the structure extends through all levels. It doesn't stop when you get to the paragraphs. So one way to think about the paragraphs is that they should try to achieve three things. They should be unified, which means each paragraph is a single topic. They have to be connected to each other. So there's a logical flow. So often you read a paper and a paragraph comes out of nowhere. Why am I being told this? Um, I don't see the connection. Why have I jumped? Um, so you have to think how one paragraph links to the next. And they need to be coherent. So there needs to be a logical connection of the sentences within that paragraph to make it unified. Okay? And if you start thinking about your paragraphs that way, you'll write them better. So just quickly then, unified paragraphs, single topic. Um, and if there's a single topic, then the topic sentence, or what I call the signpost sentence, should be at the beginning. I want to be able to see what each paragraph is about by scanning it very quickly. I don't want to have to dig it, two or three sentences into the paragraph to finally find out it's about model biases. So I want the first sentence to be, the model biases in Northern Europe are, okay? That's the topic of that paragraph. Um, 
quite often we see paragraphs that are written like that next one in order to quantify how the model biases vary, dot, 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 or even worse in the second or third sentence. Um, so when I'm scan reading that, just quickly going through very quickly by eye, um, I can't see that that paragraph is about model biases because they, those words are buried somewhere in that paragraph. Okay, so think about the signpost sentence of every paragraph. Look at all your paragraphs before you submit your article and think, is the first sentence the topic sentence of that paragraph? If not, rewrite it. Okay, you, you very rarely need a paragraph that starts in order to. That's just a no-no. There's always a question of how do I define the topic? It's all very well saying one topic, one paragraph. Um, I think the challenge comes in working out, well, what's the topic? Uh, and quite often you end up with paragraphs that are 600 words long because someone couldn't see that that topic was actually three topics. Um, how long should paragraphs be? Is there a typical length? So my rule is 150 words. If you're 600 words, it, um, it's really all about one topic, then fine. But I'm almost certain there are several topics in there that can be split out. So I tend to do that. I just split my long paragraphs and introduce a new signpost sentence, which keeps the, the logic flowing uh, without these huge paragraphs, which are hard to, to navigate. Connected paragraphs mean there's some connection. Think about the logical flow between them. Paragraph about the model simulations, which starts with the model simulations. The next one is about the observations. So it starts with the observations or something very similar to, to that. And it's connected to the previous one because you very soon say, which we are using to evaluate the model, the previous paragraph. Statistical analysis, which we use to define the best model against the observations. Okay, so everything is connected. Nothing is coming out, um, nothing is surprising you. Why am I being told about sensitivity simulations? Okay, it should be obviously connected to the previous uh, paragraphs. So you do that through topic sentences or signpost sentences, make it very clear. This is a slightly longer slide and it's one that you can read later on, but coherent paragraphs, this is one that most people struggle with. How do we make a single paragraph really coherent? And there are tips and tricks for, for dealing with that. For example, using structurally similar sentences. So the paragraph might say, three factors affect aerosol radio to forcing first, dot, 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 second, third. Um, you might have a structure of we measured, we processed, we, et cetera. If you're saying about all the different simulations, you might say simulations with um, high values, show this, simulations with low values, show that, simulations with, so use the same structure all the way through. So I can very quickly jump through your paragraph. Um, don't keep changing the way you formulate your sentences to make it sound nicer, but structure here is really important. These sort of transition words, likewise, similarly, conversely, etc. And they're all useful for binding a paragraph together. Um, you try taking those words out of a paragraph and it just reads like a set of facts. They're not connected. Um, so think about these sorts of connections within that paragraph. You might want to come back to that slide. So I get students to do this. I give them a bad paragraph and I ask them to make it more structured, use more transition words, and they make bad paragraphs so much better by just thinking about these things. Okay, sentences, right at the final part of um, your writing. Uh, I think the main thing that people do wrong with their sentences is there's lots of things I can say. And we, when I teach this, there are many more things than I'm gonna say here. But the main thing I think is backward sentences. Um, again, as much as possible, you want the topic of the sentence towards the beginning. Um, so there's an example, a bad example in red. We used a global aerosol model with new cloud physics scheme to simulate. So the topic is the simulation of aerosol, and yet it's towards the end of the sentence. So I would always rewrite that. We simulated the effect of aerosol on climate using a global aerosol model. So that using a global aerosol model supports the first part of the sentence, not the other way around. Uh, the next one, just think, what is the topic? So the next one is 
and this is very commonly written like this, according to figure one, in the west of the domain, the high altitudes, the, oh, right, finally, the observations show, okay, so all that stuff that came at the beginning is useful, but it's not the topic. So we write it, the observations show that cloud cover increases, dot, 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 in the west of the domain at high altitudes, it's supporting the observation show. Okay, it's not the topic of that sentence, the according to figure one in the West. Okay, so you shouldn't have to read most of the way down an English sentence to get what it's about. English allows you to put the topic right at the beginning all the time, unlike some other languages. So exploit that and make your sentences really clear right from the beginning. I don't think you want to do that all of the time. It's nice, it gets a little bit hard work to read something that's always topic, 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 topic. It's okay to have the odd backward sentence to relax the text a bit, but don't overuse backward sentences. Okay, this is the main flaw I see in early career writing. Final thing on sentences um, is presenting numbers and the need for, again, structure to be consistent and comparable. Um, so here in green is how I would do it. Modeled concentrations of 1.6 to 3.5 are much higher than the observed 0.2 to 0.5. They're both the same structure and you can compare them by eye very quickly. Compared to the inconsistent one, concentrations lie in the range between 1.6 and 3.5 compared to the observed 0.2 hyphen 0.5, they have a different structure and it's just hard to compare. Um, percentages, you quite often see this in newspaper media, they talk about 45% decrease compared to a halving. Those two things are just not comparable by eye, okay? So make them comparable. The dates are really very commonly mis misused. So jump to the bottom line there, change in concentration in the period 1990 to 2000 hyphen, much less than between 2000 and the end of the data record in 2010. Just rewrite that in, as in green, period 99-2000, period 2000-2010. You can compare those two immediately, your eye just makes it much easier. Cognitive ease, making it easier for the reader to see what you're comparing. And uh, this is really a common flaw I see many, many times that I can't, I can't compare these numbers. They're in different sentences. They're in different forms. Uh, it's just not as easy as it, it might be. Okay, so I'm done with the main structure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up there just by saying, maybe we can discuss this, but how do you write an article? What's the process? Um, and I'm gonna break the rule here and I'm gonna tell you how we do it in my group. Um, now clearly it's about defining the journal and um, because that is going to dictate most of your structure and style. That's the first thing. Then we get, um, then we write a storyboard. So it's just the figures and some supporting text that we then iterate quite a long time to see is this the story that we want? And before and until we have that story settled, we don't start writing. Then this is where I break the rule. We write the conclusions in abstract first, and ideally the title because it really forces you to think, what are the things I'm, this article is going to convey? Once you've decided those, I think it's much easier to write everything else. Um, so really think, if you, can you write an abstract just as you sit down to write your article? It will make you think, what is the key point this article is gonna be about? And then the article is built around that point. Okay, rather than just setting about writing an introduction and load of results and then some Oh, you know, you, the messages get lost if you do it that way, I think. Um, we can discuss this, but um, how we then iterate that and uh, how I then build up the text. I, I don't write linearly. Some people think I do. I just can sit down and write an article. I can't. I build up an article like I'm Renoir. I'm painting it here and there, all over, jumping around, slowly building it up, thinking about structure, thinking about flow, logic, connection, etc. I can't do that all in one go. I have to build it up like an oil painting, okay? So if you're doing that, that's fine. That's, uh, that's what I do too. So I'll leave the summary there. I think the main thing is think about structure at all levels, an engaging title, structured abstract, structure your paragraphs, uh, and then practice. And I think rather than just writing your own articles, which is 
obviously uh, a big a big job every time. Be a good co-author. It's easier to improve other people's articles than it is to write your own. So when you are asked to be a co-author, be a really good one. They are actually very rare. Effective co-authors who dig into the text and help improve it are extremely rare in my experience. So be that person. Think about that person's structure of paragraphs and sections and subsections as the abstract bit. Uh, help them. Um, it's it's uh, you will be very well received as a co-author if you do that. And um, treat writing as part of the research. It's a skill. It takes a long time to develop. So it, you will take five to ten years to be a highly competent scientist. I think you will take five to ten years to be a highly competent article writer too. It took me that long. I my first article was so bad. My supervisor said, "This is so bad. I can't even begin to work on it." Um, and now I'm a journal editor and I pride myself on my articles. So don't give up. You can become a very competent uh, writer of, of articles if you pay attention to it as a skill. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ken, for this very interesting presentation. I think it was really good to learn more about how we can effectively communicate our research in a scientific article. And we do have some questions now, but you can keep sending questions using the Q&A box. So maybe we can start with this more general question. Can you share any techniques for overcoming writer's block or difficulty in starting a research paper? I think you mentioned this, that first you have mm. to think about the topic and the message you want to get across. Yeah, I, I suffer terribly from writer's block. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a proud scientist. I don't send people my half-finished work. I send them my complete work and they think I don't suffer from writer's block. I get it terribly. I really struggle. I want to extract the key sentence. I, um, I go for a walk. I, my, things come to me when I'm walking around, but I walk around campus with my phone in my hand. And I, um, when, when the key sentence comes to my head, into my mind, I write it down on my phone or dictate it. Um, so getting up, walking around helps me. Um, also, like I say, is it an oil painting? Dive in. If you feel like writing the methods one day, just dive in and write them. If suddenly a bit of the um, key text for the discussion comes to you, go to the discussion, write it, put it in, come back to it later. So I, I think by doing that, you you break down that writer's block. You know, not today. I'm writing the introduction. You know, that's that's hard. Because <laughs> then you can get it stuck in one session instead of making progress, right? Yeah, make some progress. Yeah, by jumping around. And... Okay. Um, another question we have here is. Um, is it acceptable to use I instead of we in the thesis? Like I did that instead of we did in a, in a Yeah, it's a good question. I, it's extremely rare, isn't it, in an article to see I? Even in an article where there is only one author, it's quite often they use we. So I think I wouldn't say it's unacceptable. I would say it's unusual to use mm -hmm. I. Um, personally, as a journal editor, I wouldn't have a problem with people using I if it mm. was the appropriate one to use. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a bit strange if you use we when you're on your own. But... <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Is it okay to cite reviews or should we always cite the original publications? Say again, sorry. Is it okay to cite reviews or should we also cite the original publications instead of the review articles? Yeah, that was a slide I removed about the introduction. I, I think what I'm increasingly seeing is something that someone once called the 10 year forget, where people are citing the most recent work, which they're most familiar with, most excited about, and losing sight of the foundational papers. My advice would be to make sure you cite the foundational papers, not the reviews, really. It's okay to cite the reviews, they're, they're useful, but they do suck up a lot of references or citations from the fundamental papers. I think it's a little unfair. It's very common these days for people getting tenure to write a review article, which then sucks up all the citations of the fundamental papers that went into that. Uh, so I'm a little bit against it. I would um, make sure you know the foundational papers. You might get quizzed on them in your PhD viva. So if you refer then to a review, I think that looks pretty bad. Uh, cite foundational papers, then maybe have a gap in chronological gap and cite the most recent ones. I think okay. we should think about that. 
because then you also g give credit to the original publication, right? The person who actually... Yeah. And I was going to mention that some, some people, they cite the review article and then they say, and references therein. Yeah. As if they are, yeah, as if they're like... Yeah, exactly. It's lazy and it shows that you haven't done your work to understand the foundations of the subject you're studying. I, I would mark that down as a master's thesis, to be honest. Okay. Um... We have more questions here. So what are some strategies for managing time and staying organized during the research and writing process? So basically dividing your time be be between your research in the lab and writing the paper. Yeah, I, I think everyone's research flow is very different, isn't it? And very personal. Um, I encourage well, what I do when I'm, I build up papers slowly and I encourage my group to, to not treat writing as the kind of end game the writing should be part of the research inevitably <clears throat> what happens is they write their first draft and they i read it and i think there's substantial gaps that i only become apparent to me when i've read their paper and they have to then go off and do more simulations or more analysis um, so when they give it to me the research process is quite often continuing because the gaps haven't been evident until they wrote it down. So I think it's better to write early. Writing is part of the research process. And certainly for me, writing it down really makes me think what the gap is and did I address it? And I quite often, that's why I write the abstract first. And I think I can't write a very compelling abstract because I actually haven't finished the research. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there's some more I can do to make that abstract better. And, so I, I treat it as part of the research process and I, I encourage my group to do that. So when, yeah, if you're working in the lab and you're wondering, you know, can I take a break to write? I think that's fine. I, I don't think you should see it as I need to work in the lab and then I need to go write a paper. I, I think that's making life quite hard. I would, I would mix it up a bit. Makes sense, yeah. Um, what are your tips for writing review papers? So is the process much different from a research article or yeah it's hard um having just written a book a couple of years ago and what i've said there about making sure you cite the foundational papers the work required to make sure you're citing the foundational papers and you haven't missed one or how many foundational papers should i include is that a foundational paper or is it just an important follow-on one i think most of the time of writing a review is spent really critically analyzing the literature and working out what you're going to cite. I find that really hard, actually. I, it, the introduction is the last thing I write in an article because I don't actually enjoy it. It requires a lot of work, doesn't it? You have to go back yeah. and read everyone's work and uh, make sure you don't misrepresent them or misattribute discoveries to people. Uh, but that takes a deep knowledge of the literature there's actually a lot of work mm -hmm. so yeah writing reviews is very different to writing introductions of articles you can be selective in an introduction but in a review the onus is on you to do a good job mm -hmm. because that you know a lot of people are going to be using your review as, mm -hmm. as the baseline again and uh, you, you have to do a good job I, I, yeah I, I don't i don't enjoy that actually Perhaps so, um, that's that's the reason why senior researchers usually write these review papers because they are more familiar with the literature, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But it's certainly good for you because it really does make you read things. And mm -hmm. so the other two things while we're on thinking about references, the other two things I would say is certainly don't treat citations as what I call salt and pepper. What I often see is people write the introduction and think, well, I think there's a paper that said that somewhere. And, oh, I probably need to put in a reference there. And then they write it from what they think the literature said. And then they sort of sprinkle on some references and, and some citations. And they don't really fit that well. They, they're just, um, yeah, salt and pepper. Um, that, that, that's really poor. And especially in a review, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and then what that leads to is the major sin I would say in writing introductions is misattribution 
it, you say Carl's Law et al. 2013 showed something, and no, I didn't at all. Nothing like that. Yeah. <laughs> I often read that because they think Carl's Law et al. 2013. I think that was the paper that said something about natural aerosol. I'll just stick it in there, related. But I didn't say that at all. There was no black carbon in that article at all. So <laughs> go read it. You know, it's it's slightly insulting that you didn't yeah. even read my article. Yeah. So um, th th this is a time-consuming step in writing an article is getting the introduction yeah well referenced mm -hmm. don't skip it as a junior scientist when we read your work and we see misattribution and salt and pepper um, referencing we, we see it a mile off so it doesn't look good yeah um okay so we have okay so there is a question here about the journal should we always decide on the journal before starting to write the paper draft yeah i think you should because it sets the main structure it is certainly you know if you were choosing between an egu long format journal or deciding to go to um, pnas or nature or something they're very different mm -hmm. it'll only give yourself a lot of work to do if you rewrite it so the only cases where I, that isn't the case is where someone's written an article for a, a long format journal and they've given it to me and i go there's a big story in here we should be selling this big story much more yeah, uh, makes sense, yeah. go rewrite it for x journal and uh yeah then have to do a lot of work but normally i think you know and i would de define the journal at the beginning yeah it's helpful because then you have the guidelines as you mentioned right so every yeah. you have guidelines and then you can yeah, yeah. use you have the structure yeah. yeah yeah everything bigger captions all these things yeah and uh speaking of which some journals they have these significance section like um in plain language where you have to explain what are the relevance what's the relevance of your study so how do you think this should be written is it based on your abstract and then you try to simplify it for a non-specialized audience or yeah, I think that's the best way. I mean, um, we have thought in our journal of having key points, um, which is like a you know bulleted significant statement. Um, and it, we've agreed, I think, at this stage not to, because it, everyone is saying, if you've written a really good abstract, mm -hmm. according to our structure, you shouldn't need to have key points. It's duplicating. The key points ought to be there, at item number six or whatever in my list. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, write, writing the key points, the significant statement, I think that's quite easy. Just pretend you're explaining it to, uh, I don't know, uh, for someone leaving high school and uh, what yeah. words don't work. Yeah. Um, in terms of keywords, how can we select appropriate keywords? Is it true that we should not use keywords that are already in the title? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, it, it really depends how it's how they're going to be used. Um, search engine optimization is um, looking in keywords more than it is in the in the main text, and it's looking more towards the front of titles and abstracts for for search engine optimization and whether your article will come up when someone searches for aerosol forcing. It won't find it if it's only mentioned at the end of the abstract. So. Um, I don't know, honestly, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't pay too much attention to keywords. I think the keyword should be in the title and the abstract. Okay, so there's no issue yeah. in having them both places, really, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I think we're writing for humans, not search engines, but yeah. The, uh, <laughs> Makes sense, yeah. We are increasingly writing for search engines. Yeah. Mm. Um, what are your views on the use of AI tools for writing papers? Do you think they're useful or? Well, there's a question. Um, yeah, we are in the midst of this at our university. For very strong guidance for postgraduate researchers and how much they can use a AI tools um, with harder level of guidance, more restrictions than I think we even have in our journal. Um, I have to be careful not to break my own university guidance, but I, I increasingly see that uh, people are using it as a, as a very useful assistive technology um, to especially non-native English speakers. They, they are writing something that's pretty good, but just not ideal. 
and then they are using um, Gen AI tools to improve it. And I have to say, it does improve it. Uh, it makes my first pass through that paper an easier experience. Okay. I've seen that. So um, I, we're not clear yet whether that's forbidden for postgraduates. Um, so, but I see it's, it's an, a very effective assistive uh, technology. But, um, and I intend to test this this year, um, I don't think it solves all the writing problems. I don't think it puts in effective signpost sentences. I don't think it adds cor the correct and most appropriate structural phrases within a paragraph to make it very coherent. It doesn't have connection between one paragraph and one that came much earlier. It can't get that logical connection. So those things are in your hands. I, I, it'll be a while before AI can really see those logical connections that run all the way through an article, not just within one paragraph. So you, even if you're using them, that doesn't mean that all those other things I've described today are getting fixed. I'm pretty sure they're not. Mm -hmm. That's the experience of people in my group that it's certainly not doing everything for them. Okay. Um, going back to the structure of the paper, so how can we decide what should be in the supplementary material and what should be in the main text? Yeah, um, I, it's it's always a, an evaluation in a particular case, of course, but um, I tend to think does, I would put something in the supplementary or the, even the appendix if having it in the main paper breaks the flow. So, for example, if you have a, a key result um, that's very clearly exemplary case, which just is reproduced six times over uh, in other cases, I would tend to show that one case very clearly in the paper and do a good job of explaining it and then put the others in a reduced form in the appendix or supplementary. Um, so your article should tell the story and make that as accessible as possible. Um, if you're adding extra material into the main text that just lengthens a section that doesn't add insight, then I think it's time to think about moving that out. Um, you don't want to remove too much that your article becomes, you know, really a summary, but mm -hmm. I think it's worth removing duplicating parts that add nothing to the story and could mm -hmm. be reduced and put in the, in the supplementary. Okay. So think of your article as a story and uh, whether that's just getting in the way of the, of the story. So the reader shouldn't need to look at the supplementary material to understand your, your research and get the main exactly. message. So the article exactly. should be standalone. And, okay. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to put in the supplementary um, cases, for example, that contradict the main case in the paper. You shouldn't cherry pick and put the, the results that worked in the paper and the results that didn't quite work in the supplementary. That, that, that's that's uh, malpractice. But if they're all telling the same story and they're all consistent and you're just repeating, I yeah. think put them in the supplementary. Okay. So speaking about these negative results, um, what about papers reporting them, negative or inconclusive results? Do you have any tips on how to approach them? Yeah, I think they should be published. And mm -hmm. I don't think we do enough. Mm -hmm. um, just like we thought in abstract chemistry and physics that measurement should be published, even if the science from them wasn't yet clear. That's how we started atmospheric measurement techniques and um, uh, ge geoscientific model development and these other journals uh, because we thought there were aspects of science that need to be published that weren't being published. You couldn't find measurement data. We now have measurement reports for measurement data. So negative results, I think, really should be published more. Um, you're not going to win a prize for a negative result usually, but if you've spent a year doing something and uh, the result is negative, I, I think it's useful to publish it. It's useful for the community, right? So they, yeah. 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 Um, okay, moving on to some authorship questions. So as a first author, how can you manage the contributions of your co-authors and still remain in charge of your paper? For example, is it appropriate to give people a deadline to comment on the manuscript? And if they do not respond after the deadline, what should you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're in charge. Uh, even if you're an early career author, you're in charge. And I, I think co-authors like me, not early career, 
uh, appreciate when someone is very clear about the timeline, rather than just giving you a paper and hope you read it sometime. They say, can I have this by next Wednesday? And I say, no, uh, but the following Wednesday, you know, I think having that clarity is really good. Um, yeah, you're in charge of that process. So this is something I didn't show, but we discuss in my teaching is um, you have sort of circles of co-authors. You have your immediate supervisor and maybe co-supervisor and maybe one other person who are you share that paper with repeatedly until it's in a very good form. And only then you send it out to your other co-authors, maybe the ones who provided a small number of measurements or some model results or something. And they're in the outer circle. Um, and you're giving them a well-formed paper mm. and you can expect that back fairly quickly because they're not having to do a lot of work on it. Okay. Um, and then there might be an even further outer circle of people who insist on being on a paper that probably shouldn't, you know, those sorts of people are hanging yeah. on. Um, so, I, yeah, I think set a deadline. Anything so, less than two weeks yeah. is probably too short, but yeah, I would, I would always okay. set a deadline. It's a, it's a related question also. In terms of authorship, how can we decide who we should include in a paper? There is also the acknowledgement session where people's contributions can be listed. So do you have an advice on how we can decide who is going to be acknowledged in the acknowledgement session and who is going to be a co-author? Mm, yeah, very tricky uh, question. And uh, yeah, um, uh, my university has written guidelines on authorship. So this is to protect people who, you know, some senior lab manager says, I'm on your paper, regardless of whether I even read it. Uh, that's not allowed in Leeds. So there's clear guidelines on that. So you probably all have that in your universities or organizations. Look for that. Um, publishing ethics or something. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to err on the side of inclusion of authors. Um, quite often their contribution is more substantial than you perhaps realized. Mm -hmm. We have something in Leeds in the wording, which I disagree with, of data provider, as if somehow this was just someone who handed you a, a floppy disk with some data on. Uh, but they often were, you know, people involved in the campaign who did a lot of measurements. So they would mm -hmm. definitely be involved in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, talk to your, if you're an early career scientist, talk to your supervisor and hope they have a, a decent view on it. They're not all do, I think. But, really take some advice about who to include and who not. And I would say err on the side of inclusion. It probably doesn't hurt. Okay. Fending is probably worse, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one last question now. Um, there are only so many different ways in which we can describe a method. If the methods are the same as the ones employed in previous papers, do we still need to write this session differently each time? Yeah, another good question. I, I took this out of my presentation for speed. Uh, um, it, when you have, so my group has this, we write papers with the same model over and over and over. And people tend to take the text that was written before and use it rather similar again, but they always rewrite it a little bit in their voice. So it's not like they just copy and paste. They always rewrite a bit. Um, but I think it's acceptable to have luck some, some parts of the text that are exactly the same as in your previous paper. If it's exactly the same method employed by you, don't copy somebody else's method on that basis. <laughs> but uh, if it's your method, you developed it and you're using it again, this would be picked up by plagiarism software, mm -hmm. but uh, every editor would look at it and go, it's their method. They're just repeating it. Why, why change that? Um, if you're explaining methods from that are very well established a paper on the method somewhere that you're citing, don't just say the methods are cited here or explained here, summarize the methods and then refer to that article because the article needs to be self-contained. You need to be able to mm -hmm. give everyone an overview of what the methods are, even if the details are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So don't just say for methods refer to Carl's Law 2013, that, that's not acceptable. So okay. a summary of those methods um, some repetition if it's really just routine. And um, then if the readers want to, to see the details, they would go to the references or to the supplementary material or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think um, time's up now. So thank you very much to Ken for presenting to us and thank you everyone for attending and participating. And yeah, thank you.